everybody. Today we have with us Claris Backus, who is a manager of cultural resources at Helix Environmental and has spent several decades as a California archaeologist. Additionally, he's published on multiple components of archaeology in the state, uh, including rock art, which is what we'd like to talk about today. But first of all, Claris, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Yeah, glad I could help you out. So the first thing that I think we should go over is just when we use the term rock art, what do we refer to with that term within the state of California? In California, we're, we're talking about either pictographs or petroglyphs. Um, some researchers also categorize stuff like incised stones, portable art as being a type of rock art. But in California, we're really looking at Pictographs, which means they're painted, they're, they actually would make their own paint and paint um, with pigments, or pictographs, or I'm sorry, those are pictographs, petroglyphs are etched. And in some, some rock art sites, we actually see both. So we see ones that are etched and then painted as well. Um, there are also cupules, which are considered a form of rock art in California. They're a little more rare. They're actually, they look like little tiny bedrock mortars. They're little cupules that are that are etched into a rock face and often it'll be on a vertical face <clears throat> so there's as far as we can tell there's no real functional uh, aspect to them they seem to be ceremonial so those are usually sort of uh, lumped in with rock art in California as well. So we've got multiple types of rock art in the state and uh, are they equally prevalent? I mean can you go out pretty much anywhere in California and find rock art? or is it kind of more focused in certain regions in California? It's definitely focused in certain regions. Um, the painted stuff tends to be in the coastal areas. Uh, the Chumash area north of Los Angeles is a huge locus for painted rock art for, for pictographs. Um, and the, the Sierras tend to have painted stuff. We also see a fair amount of painted stuff sort of at the uh, there's like a transition zone between the Eastern Sierra and going out into the desert where we tend to see a lot of painted stuff. Um, the, the real big centers for rock art in California tend to be out in the desert and they tend to be pecked rock art as opposed to painted rock art. Um, so if, if you look at Little Petroglyph Canyon, for instance, in, uh, I guess that's actually Inyo County, um, on the China Lake Naval, um, Naval Weapons Station um, is one of the biggest concentrations of rock art actually in the world, actually. I mean, it's mile after mile after mile of, of uh, pecked rock art that are within these canyons up there. So that's where we tend to see huge assemblages of rock art tend to more, I think, be out in the desert. Um, Although there is some in the Chumash area, there are some caves and that type of thing that have quite a bit of rock art in them, but they tend to be a little more isolated. Yeah. So this brings up, I think, an interesting mm -hmm. conundrum because on one hand, you've got rock art as you know some of the you know the most uh, prolific rock art in the world can be found in our state, um, and you might even say mm -hmm. it's like characteristic of California archaeology. But then on the other hand, I'd say that there's a lot of archaeologists who are hesitant to study it. And the same way that they might, you know, a lithic flake or something like that and consider it as something you can use to build archaeological data. And so yeah. with that conundrum, I guess my question is, what do you think are the limits of our ability to study rock art? What can we learn from it as archaeologists today? But also, do you think that there's some instances where uh, there are some questions that we just can't answer? Well, there's certainly questions we can't answer. I mean, I, th I think any time that we start thinking too literally about meaning or, or even to a certain extent function of rock art, we get ourselves into a situation where we have to ask ourselves, what kind of data do we need to, if we come up with a hypothesis of, let's say, the, the, the function of this rock art was, what kind of data do we need to prove that hypothesis or disprove that hypothesis? To me, the, the thing is, you know, let's ask some different questions. There's certainly some interesting stuff to be said about the actual physical aspects of the rock art itself. I mean, um, I've done a fair amount of work, and we can get into this later, but um, sourcing pigments, looking at, at sources on pigments, looking at composition for pigments, 
Pigments often had a ceremonial values. So they were traded between groups. Um, so if you've got a pigment that shows up in two rock art sites that are 500 miles apart from each other and they're the same pigment, that tells you something very interesting about what was going on, opens up some interesting questions about the archaeology. So, um, yeah, the rock art has gotten a bad rap from a lot of archaeologists. And I think because historically we tended to ask questions about rock art that we couldn't answer. And I think everybody got very frustrated with that. And there's, there's also a, um, a lot of avocational archaeologists, hobbyists, get into archaeology through rock art. That's sort of their avenue into archaeology. And that adds a very, those people tend not to be very well trained formally. They're, they tend to focus on a lot of the sort of new age aspects of it and that kind of thing. Um, so having all that just sort of rubs a lot of archaeologists the wrong way. I think if they, if they ask better questions, I think there'd be a lot of data potential there for rock art. Got it. Yeah. So, so it sounds like things like meaning and you know uh, rationale for creating rock art in the first place that might be very hard to get to but we can learn things about trade or you know even perhaps yeah. like you know uh, movement of peoples uh, right. with rock art as a data set so maybe you could talk about yeah. how we can accomplish that I mean what tools do we have to um, answer those sorts of questions well, we can look at a lot of different things. We, I, I talked about pigment analysis for one thing, which is a, you know, in, in my case, I analyzed pigment for pottery for my master's thesis. Um, and I've done, I've done analysis of rock art pigment as well, which is not an easy study to do because it involves having to actually harvest pigment from rock art sites. Beyond that, though, there's things like superimposition, which is a very important notion in rock art. Um, you know, you can think of a rock art panel as having stratigraphy, just like the ground does, if you want to look at it that way. And a lot of times we have different rock art in different styles that's been reproduced one over the top of the other. And so you're basically, you're seeing a time depth there. You're seeing, um, in some cases, you may have another population comes in, they cancel out the previous population's rock art with something that's a completely different style. Um, maybe that gets scratched over by another group. And... Um, I've done some, some work, which actually turned out really cool in Vasquez Rocks, just north of Los Angeles, um, where we see a lot of this. We see sort of a mix of, there's sort of an initial Chumash looking pictograph style. And then later on, we see both scratched and peck styles that are very, they look just like something out of the Great Basin. They look something out of the Mojave Desert, basically. Um, and, and these are superimposed upon each other. So it's, it's interesting in that case, you know, we've been able to, mainly through some real high-end digital photography, able to kind of tease these layers apart and try to get a sense of what came first, what came afterward, you know, and then you can start looking at the rest of the material record because these all, none of these sites exist in isolation. They're all, they're all a site that's got lithics and that's got, you know, other artifact classes that you can also look at. So we can really start looking at, you know, the association between some of these art, art, uh, other artifact classes and rock art, I think is very interesting too. So that's, that's quite the idea that, that rock art, you can think of uh, the same way that you would layers of dirt, you know, as, uh, you know, stratigraphy. Yeah, right. So with, um, you mentioned, um, you know, advanced photography and imaging, is the idea that the older images will be harder to detect and fainter to the eye? And photography helps enhance those older images? Yeah, um, the photography is particularly good for isolating individual colors and, and drawing them out. So um, <clears throat> I've had really good particularly um, good results on pictographs where the pictographs are really faded, where you can barely see them anymore. And by using high-end digital photography and going in in uh, Photoshop, or there's a, there's a specialized rock art program as well that does uh, image manipulation on your computer. It's pretty striking, really, how, how well some of this stuff can pull out, you know, very faint images. Uh, and then, you know, you get a, you get a site like Vasquez Rocks. I mean, you've, 
you've got, there's panels there that probably have five different layers of stuff going on. Um, they're completely unique styles. It's not like the same style over and over. It's clearly, you know, somebody else came from a different area. I mean, they're not the same people doing the same thing over and over, you know, where you've got literally a new population coming in, canceling out the old population by scratching out their rock art, you know, but they're bringing yeah. a whole new style. In. No, I, I mean, I'm going to go kind of nerdy anthro kid on you for a second. I mean, couldn't that be kind of a okay. sense of, oh, like cultural diffusion and the idea that, you know, does it have to be displacement? Could it be people saying, hey, like, that's like a neat thing they're doing over there. Let's do that, it too. Could be. OK, you know, I think so that's totally, you know, yeah. And then, you know, so then you ask yourself, what information would we need to to prove that? hypothesis or disprove it you know i don't know gotcha. but yeah you can look at the you can look at that in a lot of different ways um and then you know when we see, we 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 look at the artifact record to get similar information i mean you know um I, i'm talking about the when i was talking about the kosos we're talking about pi and shoshone um populations that are there that pretty much are, are relatively recent populations. And chances are what was happening in that particular area was the people that did that rock art are no longer there. And they were, they were I don't know if you got into the pneumic spread with your class at all, but this notion of pneumic speakers starting in sort of the Tehachapi version and spreading out into the Great Basin um, to the North and West. And, you know, that, if that hypothesis is true, then that population in areas like the Kosos replaced an existing population that was there already. It was probably responsible for this rock art. Um, but that population has got a very, some other artifacts with it. There are fairly unique signatures. You know, desert side notch arrow points are considered sort of, you know, hallmarks of that Shoshonean incursion. You know, so to be able to, Compare that information to rock art or to, to treat up rock art the same way, I think is really interesting. And it just gives us one more um, set of data that we can apply to these questions. Gotcha. I think they're a really interesting question. So we can yeah. see it as, as a complementary line of evidence, in addition to diagnostic artifacts, in addition to linguistic information. Yeah. And you stack that all together and you say maybe the best explanation here is a movement of people. Um, which, which makes sense. So, um, I, I've learned a lot about rock art just talking this past a couple moments, maybe, and this is a, a question that's very, you've gotten it before, but I'm going to spring it on you just for the purposes of, um, my students who are interested in California archaeology, but, uh, what has been your favorite aspect of being a California archaeologist? My favorite aspect of being a California archaeologist. I, I've been asking everyone so far in the, the interview series that at the end, just to see, you know, the diversity of what people enjoy about working in the state. I don't know. Give me a, what, what would a typical answer be to something like that? I'm not quite sure I understand, you know, do sure, you like yeah. the paycheck? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm no, not. You know, it's funny yeah. that. Some of the best times I've ever had in the field were doing rock art. And I did, um, got into it yet, but um, I used to do quite a bit of infrared and ultraviolet fluorescence um, of pictographs, which you got to do at night. Um, because you open the shutter on the camera and leave it open and then you hit the the rock our panel repeatedly with bursts of ultraviolet light and it causes a fluorescence mm -hmm. and they, the, the pigment will actually fluoresce very 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 faint so you mean it takes hours to do these photographs and and just you know i've had times where i've done these sites where i had to hike way back into china lake or way up into the sierras and it's three in the morning and i'm all there by myself and you know, just uh, just some really magical, fun times. I think I've had doing that. I think some of my best memories in the field. I think are doing rock art stuff. You know, because you're not getting your hands dirty either. But <laughs> yeah, I, I doubt no um, one else would have a reason to be out of Boulder 
in the middle of the desert at three in the morning unless at three you're in the doing morning. what you're doing yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know you gotta and, and and especially on china lake because the guys in the base are like you want to do what <laughs> you want to be out in the morning yeah, yeah. sure no. not to mention you don't want to get blown but, up or something exactly yeah. yeah um yeah that's that's magic stuff as far as i'm concerned those are good times right on